Yo, what's going on? Uh, I just watched the first episode of Moon Knight. I'll do a little review or whatever. Just talk about the episode at the end of this video. But first, we got uh, Moon Knight episode one. Breakdown from New Rockstar, Easter eggs and details that you missed. Welcome back to New Rockstars. I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Marvel's Moon Knight Episode 1 as we meet our hero grappling with dissociative identity disorder and one of those identities possessed by an Egyptian moon deity, which gives us all a new cover story for when we obliterate our friends' bathrooms. Uh, I that swear scene it was, was wild, shit bro. In the tub. As we always do here at New Rockstars, we're going to break this down in depth because unlike other MCU titles, Moon Knight is less about the Marvel Easter eggs than it is truly impressive cinematic details that make this series a fascinating mystery and character exploration. Also, our merch partners have dropped new Moon Knight inspired hoodies and shirts, a cool looking new latest obsession design. And when you get one of those, you'll get the added option to write in a custom shout out that will appear on screen in our Moon Knight after shows. So get your hands on one of those at New Rockstars Merch. Type of custom message was that? <laughs> not with the hero, but with the villain, Arthur Harrow. Tattooed on his arm are scales, head in the mouths of crocodiles. Those croc heads also on the head of his staff. For the Egyptian deity he serves. I Emmett. couldn't even a tell what that was associated when I first with judgment, saw it. seen with the head of a crocodile, front legs of a lion, and hindquarters of a hippopotamus. The Egyptians believe that when you die, the god of the dead, Anubis, weighs your heart on scales against the weight of a feather, and if it weighs more, you are fed to Emmet. Emmet was not worshipped as a god, per se, but feared by Egyptians as the devourer of the dead, dooming them if they didn't adhere to the principle of ma'at, which referred to a way of life that pursued truth and balance and justice. Philosophically, there's actually a lot in common here with Thanos, another MCU villain with a religious zeal to cull all of life by half. But whereas Thanos saw fairness in randomness, Harrow and his disciples believed that one's soul should be judged on its merits, past, present, and future. At least you can imagine in a post-Thanos society, one's fate being determined by a bit more order is a cult mentality Kool-Aid yeah. flavor more folks would like the taste of. In his ritual, he shatters a glass and then puts the broken pieces in his sandals, walking on them with bare feet. Now, walking on broken glass is a real-world meditative practice, but Harrow hides what? this inside his shoes, spending the whole day enduring great pain but telling no one. This tells us that he is not doing this for show. He is a true believer. And the music we hear is Bob Dylan's Every Grain of Sand, one of Dylan's 80s spiritual tracks. The music was hitting, too, during that episode. Kind of like how Arthur Harrow sees himself as a reborn evangelist. Every Grain of Sand refers to how Dylan saw the master's hand in every time any particle of nature. And for Harrow, in every person, he sees Emmett's judgment. That could be another reason he walks on this broken glass. With every step, he pulverizes this glass back into grains of sand because that's what glass is. It's it's sand when it's superheated. The Marvel Studios title card has been updated so that now our new friends, the Eternals, I can saw that. on the inside I of saw the that. behind Rocket. And by the way, they put Rocket. I knew I was going to watch New Rock Stars after the episode, so I was like, I paying close attention to every single detail, and I did notice that. I was eyeing the fuck out the screen, bro. I only blinked, I only blinked like three times now that whole episode. Our new friends, the Eternals, can be seen on the inside of the R behind Rocket. And by the way, they put Rocket back where Peter Parker was in the No Way Home title card because Peter can only appear in live action titles that Sony approves of. And by uh, approves of, I mean uh, get some money to pay for their uh, poopy vampire movies. And suddenly the music Damn. changes from Bob Dylan shitting on to Morbius. Engelbert didn't even come A out Man yet. Without Love, which is about a man who wakes up every day realizing he's alone. The first line actually juxtaposed is Steven's inability to remember his past love, Layla. And the third line reflects how Moonlight now shows him the way via his new soulmate, one that he is not yet aware of, Khonshu, the Egyptian moon deity. And we meet Stephen Grant. Now in the comics, Stephen Grant is actually the second identity of Mark Spector. Mark is really the main figure, the badass mercenary that we start with. And Stephen is a new identity he adopts, that of an elite billionaire. But I assume this series changed Stephen to this awkward museum employee to avoid the Batman Bruce Wayne comparisons. Because when Moon Knight first came out in the Marvel comics, a lot of people considered him Marvel's Batman. Now, behind Steven's Still. bed as he awakes are a number of texts on world history and architecture, ancient Egypt, etc. These books hovering over his head as he sleeps reflect how his dreams, or what he thinks are his dreams, take him back to that world. Now, in the foreground, you can see his Rubik's Cube completed, which is interesting because while trying to stay awake, Steven intentionally fiddles with it and tosses it, never finishing it, suggesting that when the Mark identity takes over, he might go ahead 
ahead and solve the Rubik's Cube. We see how he strapped his leg to the bed and surrounded himself with sand, all as a kind of sleepwalking security measure. But his first real step forward of the day is his bare foot on sand, which the camera lingers on, showing he is more connected to the sands of Egypt than Harrow, whose first step of his day is on larger chunks of glass. His goldfish Gus is only one working what? fin, like Nemo! A comparison the pet store owner later invokes. But with one working fin, this poor guy is literally swimming in circles just like Steven is. And you can see at the bottom of the fish tank is lined with a pyramid, King Tut's head, an Egyptian obelisk, and a sunken boat. Right. He talks to his mother on the phone, probably talking to no one. Hello, Mom. I didn't notice all that shit in the fish tank. But I did Mom, think that he her. wasn't talking to anyone after the second phone out. call. Now, assuming Steven's mother doesn't really exist, is he sending himself these postcards? Is Mark sending them to Steven to help keep him in that dormant routine? Later on in the gift shop, we do see a rack of postcards, so perhaps this is where he's getting the postcards that he is mailing to himself. He says goodbye to his mom by saying, Anyway, sorry I missed you, mom. I'll try again tomorrow. Later, gators. Yes, crocodiles are different from alligators. We talked about this in Loki. But it will be later, later that skaters. he faces this taxonomic order of reptiles. But also, this all poses the question, if Stephen Grant is just another identity of Mark Spector, who does Stephen think he is talking on the phone to? Is he just leaving voicemails with a random number? Is there a voice inbox that Mark Spector set up to help Stephen along with this charade? It's just interesting how all of Steven's closest relationships are people who cannot talk back to him, like the street performer Crawley. Now behind that bus is a building marked Atlantis Island, maybe a nod to Marvel's Atlantis, home of Namor, or maybe just another building called Atlantis. They actually shot all the London exteriors in Budapest. So later when we see what's supposed to be London's National Museum of Art, the architecture is actually that of Budapest's Museum of Fine Arts. They use VFX to swap out the Hungarian for English. And this museum is first shown in the reflection of a puddle that Steven steps through. Reflections and mirrored surfaces is a recurring motif in this series, all a way of showing how Steven connects with his other identities. Steven catches a girl stuffing her gum in a mini pyramid of Giza. It's not like there's anything in there. Yeah, maybe not. But in there, something wicked. A line foreshadowing wicked. in two ways. Of course, the wicked jackal that Stephen will flee in this museum later, but also trailer footage suggests that Stephen or Mark will explore the great pyramids of Giza and they might find something inside of them. Also, some foreshadowing. quote from Shakespeare's Macbeth, the witches who say, Boy, the pricking of my tombs, something wicked this way comes. In the play, the witches are foreseeing a monster of their own making, Macbeth, just like how for Stephen, the hero of this story, the monster is currently inside of him. He explains the Egyptian burial ritual and how their hearts were judged, and the girl responds with, And did it suck for you? Getting rejected from the field of reeds? Well, that don't make sense, because I'm not dead, am I? Stevie. Am I? Yeah, I love that second, am I? That Oscar Isaac sneaks in, showing how this girl triggered his recent lapses with reality. Even now, he doesn't know if he's alive or dead. Also, weird question for that girl to ask. I don't trust that good. Later, while doing inventory with Donna, he hands her the stuffed hippos, then moves to a box containing the stuffed lions and the stuffed crocodiles. Together, these three are the anatomical components of Emmett. What he points the to hell, a ball bro? On the poster. The Ennead, you know, like... The super group of Egyptian gods, you know, you've got Horus, Osiris, Tefnut, oh, Shu. There's been a major blunder because they've got seven gods here and the Ennead has nine. Now he is correct that the Ennead of Egyptian mythology has nine members. The sun god, Atom, his children, Shu and Tefnut, their children, Geb and Nut, and then their children, Osiris, really? Isis, and Set and Nephthys. And then sometimes the Ennead includes Horus, son of Osiris and Isis. But this poster also lists Hathor, the sky goddess, who is not usually listed among the Ennead, despite being a very important deity who, we should note, mates with Khonshu, the moon deity, to enable creation. But based on promo material, we will likely see the nine members of the Ennead and their human avatars later this season. Steven chats with his gold-painted street performer listed in the credits as Crawley. Now in the comics, Bertrand Crawley is a homeless man in New York who serves as an informant to Moon Knight. He walks around posing as a British aristocrat. We get another awesome puddle mirror here as Steven says goodbye to Crawley. What we initially think is right side up is actually upside down when a leaf drops on the puddle on the top half of the frame. As Stephen tries to stay awake, in his textbook there's a mention of the Great Rift, God's Turn Away from Man, which feels like it's setting up this show's mythology with Khonshu and the nine Ennead members' Bro, relationship. that shit was on the screen for half a second. We're essentially adding a new second. layer to the MCU plan of implying all gods of human society from the history we know are interwoven with the Marvel mythology, as we saw with the Asgardians' connections with Norse mythology and the Eternals' connections with all other forms of mythology. We have yet to see how the Christian religion ties into all 
all of that. But my friends, Mephisto is coming. But if this textbook is supposed to be showing the familial lineage of the Ennead, even if it's going youngest to oldest, it does seem a bit out of order. It's just a bit odd to list Osiris first, whatever order you would go in. But remember, all of this is through the eyes of Stephen, who's certainly knowledgeable about Egyptian mythology, but he does have an unstable mind. He is an unreliable narrator, a point of view character through whom we are not seeing objective reality necessarily. So who knows how much of this presented reality is actually real and how much of it is going to be revealed as a fantasy at some point. He tosses up his Rubik's Cube and he suddenly finds himself face down, jaw dislocated in the hills. That scene fucked me up, bro. Village. This is actually I was like, God, damn. So, apparently when Stephen fell asleep, Mark Spector took over, went to the Alps to steal the scarab from this castle, then leapt out the window and Stephen woke up on the ground. A voice speaks to him. Go back to sleep, worm. Yes, this is F. Murray Abraham as Khonshu. <laughs> Interesting that he calls Stephen the worm as if Stephen is the invasive critter that does not belong inside the mind. Khonshu, of course, the Egyptian moon deity, possessed Mark Spector, choosing him as his avatar, giving Mark supernatural powers, but he has less control over Mark's Stephen identity. In his pocket, he finds a golden scarab with Egyptian hieroglyphics. You can actually see a closer look at these in the closing credits of the episode. We did our best to translate these, but they do contain a mix of known alphabet symbols and then other unknown ones. The right and the left halves of the scarab are mirrored, so if you look at the dividing line in the middle and go to the column to the right of that, at the top of that, that is a reed, which translates to either an E or an I beside a seated figure. Beneath that, there's a scarab shape, then the open mouth, that's an R, then another I beside a different seated figure, then a pair of figures. The column to the right of that is topped with the quail chick that- Bro, the fact that it is actually somebody's job to- do all this little shit and make sure it makes sense is fucking crazy. And then there's only a few people like him who will actually actually catch the details. Like, what the fuck, bro? Presents the U or the W, followed by another I. Beneath that, the vulture, that's an A. And then a figure I don't recognize that looks like either a boat, maybe an oil lamp, and then the horned viper, that represents F, and then another figure I don't recognize. I I'm gonna keep working on this, folks, but uh, all you Egyptologists out there, hit me up. This series has been described as Indiana Jones meets Fight Club, and already you're seeing the parallels there, of course. Especially Indiana Jones' The Last Crusade, which had a whole set piece in a Germanic castle. But by sticking with one man's point of view, his consciousness suddenly switching to a totally different context is something that we've seen actually in Christopher Nolan's Memento, which is also told in a non-linear narrative structure that reflected the mind of the protagonist who suffered from short-term memory loss. It resulted in him finding himself in intense moments with no knowledge of how he got there. Similarly, the FX series Legion, which actually follows the Marvel mutant of David Holler, also explores the intersection of superpowers with mental health struggles and leaves the viewer never quite sure of what is real or not. Just in how in the scene all the shooters speak to each other in English? What are you doing? He's heading for the village. Just a little indicator that these men in their matching clothes are likely not native to this alpine town, but rather like many cults in the real world, move to these places that just kind of like take the town over with their interesting Rajishni outfits. Stephen pulls a Harrison Ford fugitive maneuver by joining the procession with some headgear to blend in. In this case, it's his white hoodie, white being the color of Moon Knight's wardrobe. Arthur Harrow parts the crowd, showing his long blown out hair. Now Harrow in the comics is really a one-off villain from one issue in 1985, a guy with a half-paralyzed face carrying out some Nazi experiments in Mexico. Really, I think this guy's gonna have a deeper identity that gets revealed later in the series. Ethan Hawke said his version of the character is based on David Koresh, leader of the Christian cult, the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas. One follower submits himself for judgment. What? I judge you in Amit's name with but a fraction of her power. The tattoo scales sink with the swinging of the staff, which turn green to signal a balanced soul. Meanwhile, the old woman, the tattoo Two turns red, with one scale having a larger pile weighing it down. I've been good my entire life. I believe you, but the scales see everything. Perhaps it's something that lies ahead. And so he drains her life force, leaving her skin gray. So Anna judges her by the sins she will commit in the future. And unless this is all bullshit, and let's be honest, it might be, <laughs> this would be enough. This would be another example of destiny existing in the MCU. Something described in various ways by the Ancient One and He Who Remains in Loki. Like the TVA pruning young Sylvie, this woman is being punished for future violations. Both of these systems of justice cruelly denying the possibility of a multiverse where people can make infinitely different 
choices. Khonshu refuses to let Steven hand over the scarab. Kudos to Oscar Isaac for his physical work here, the way he can divorce his head and his facial expressions from the rest of his body. And then when he marches away from Harrow, he takes these big dramatic steps, similar to the big strides <laughs> the towering Khonshu himself would take. As that they pry really the good. scarab from him, Steven flickers in and out of consciousness, coming to with blood. This shit was crazy, bro. Just the amount of blood on the scarab in his palm. Is that was kind of brutal. We've ever seen the MCU get, as it implies he may have had to rip off a few fingers to get that scarab out of their hands. He Look at the, the cupcake delivery the van. head trauma. Whams wake me up. Another cry for help. Niggas was leaking on the ground. Up from this nightmare. The fact that this is playing on the radio, maybe just a bit of an ironic joke, or just like an interesting coincidence that one might see in a dream. Stephen Grant wakes up for this, thinking it's a dream, but as we find out later, it's not a dream. So why did such an ironic song play during it then? I just love how this show blurs the lines for what seems real and what seems fantasy. As he struggles against his pursuers, he flashes forward again and now find the gun in his hand, the windshield blown out, the gunshot shattered the side window, and one of those pursuing cars flipping. I love how this whole scene plays out like a classic car chase with one person steering, one person shooting, but with one man doing everything and only seeing half of it. Think how terrifying that would be. A logging truck overturns and he swerves around it, two more trucks wedge around him, and then Mark takes over again. Bro, the fact that, like... <laughs> that part was funny. When he, he shoved the fucking cup cupcake in the dude's face and when it didn't do anything then it was like oh sorry sorry <laughs> he was like i take it back bro that shit had me dying this shit. but this shit is a scary ass concept yeah, i like how bro. on the transition out of it you hear the gunshot as if the gunshot is what woke steven up the gunshot that probably shot the driver of that sedan but before the logs crush him steven wakes up he thinks back home presumably mark was able to get out of that somehow made his way back to the uk back into the apartment back into bed and a shot from behind proves this showing steven with reflections on either side of him proving his truly split identity yet his leg harness the sand ring the door tape all seemingly under disturbed but think about it if it was another identity taking over not him sleepwalking mark would have been fully capable of avoiding the sand replacing the tape himself it's a huge pile of crumbled tape in that trash can i highly doubt steven counted all the watts but gus now has a second fully functioning fin as indicated by the pet store clerk mark during that last period must have replaced the goldfish kind of like parents who replace kids goldfish when the fish hmm. die and they hope the kids don't notice steven realized he <laughs> was that picture at the steak restaurant because it's <laughs> sunday not friday I'll have a steak, please. Yeah. Sure. What cut would you like? This thing it was the best bit. His acting yeah. was solid right here, bro. The steak. I was like, That's damn. That I want. Sent a couple you really feel for the um, man. And how'd you like that? Good. Yeah, very good. Very good. Yeah. I'll, uh, put you for well done. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. That's absolutely delicious. Oof, for anyone who eats steak, this is painful to watch. You never cook a filet to be well done. You're ruining it. I'd rather eat poodle shit. But obviously, Steven is a vegan, and Mark was the meat eater who picked this steakhouse to begin with. He finds some scratches on his apartment floor for where the table was dragged over to access the hidden crawl space, and on the cell phone in the end, he finds all the calls are to Layla, except one listing Ducamp. Jean-Paul Ducamp is a mercenary and ex-French Foreign Legion officer who is a partner to Mark Spector in the comics. Mark's voice speaks to him, and he sees the reflection in the bathroom mirror shaking his head when Steven hadn't done so. He flees the elevator, which stops mysteriously on an empty third floor, and then again on the second, where Khonshu lurches toward him from the end of the hall. Terrifying horror imagery here. As in the comics, Khonshu has a beaked skull and a crescent moon staff, and his limbs are wrapped in linen like a mummy, though I like how his tail wrappings seem to float as if detached from gravity. Just amazing character design here. Khonshu grabbing the lift door turns amazing. it into an elderly woman, but even that doesn't make total sense think about it because if she was at the other end of the hall she would be nowhere near the summoning button and despite this elevator previously headed down from the second floor it's now back up on the fifth floor where his elderly neighbor is visiting her friend claire and we saw Steven repeatedly hit the button for the ground floor, it should not have gone back up to the fifth. Now, sure, this may just be the building's electrical problems that Steven alluded to, or maybe Khan Shu screwing with him, but really, I think, another example of how basic things in Steven's reality are not abiding by normal logic. Steven turns around and sees Khan Shu right behind him. I love this close-up because you can see all the texturing and indentations on Khan Shu's skull, like the little hairs on nice the right back there. of it. But now when we whip pan to Steven's reaction, he's back on the bus, meaning from the fifth floor to now, Mark must have been in control. We see Khonshu standing on the street, 
but he disappears when the lamppost <laughs> crosses frame. On his bus, Steven realizes as he hops off, Harrow was on that bus. So either Mark was pursuing or more likely being pursued by Arthur Harrow before Steven regained control. Harrow and his followers corner Steven at the museum. Had Ahmed been free, she would have prevented Hitler and the destruction he wrought. Nero, the Armenian genocide, Pol Pot. While alluding to history's worst crimes against humanity, Harrow invokes the baby Hitler thought experiment. What if Hitler could have been prevented from becoming the mass murdering dictator? Something Deadpool 2 addresses head on. Harrow goes on to say, But she was betrayed. Was she? By indolent fellow gods. Oh. By even her own avatar. Avatars, mm. blue people. Love that film. By Avatar. <laughs> you mean that? I mean. The anime. Yeah, Steven references both James Cameron's Avatar and Avatar <laughs> yeah. The Last Airbender, but also setting up the mystery of who Emmett's original <laughs> Avatar was and why they betrayed Emmett. Perhaps influences from the Eternals, or maybe Pharaoh Rama Tut, aka Kang the Conqueror, who also judges people by their futures. When Harrow tries to assess Steven's soul, Emmett's scales never settle. There's chaos in you. That's because Steven has a completely different moral alignment than Mark does. And the destiny of this uh. total individual is really a complete variable depending on whoever is taking control. Now, would that mean that anyone with dissociative identity disorder that Harrow assessed would get the same result? Maybe, but I really think Steven and Mark's condition is amplified by Conchu's possession, making him uniquely impossible to judge. That night as the museum closes, the crescent moon glimmers overhead, foretelling this as the night, moon night, will finally rise. Steven passes that. his reflection and the two others remain in the glass. Mark turning back to see what is stalking Stephen, in this case, the jackal that moves in the foreground, a jackal released by Arthur Harrow to recover the scarab. Jackal. In another shot, Stephen is perfectly framed behind a half-broken bust. Just a really cool way of showing how he is sharing his mind with one of these ancient figures. The jackal appears again behind statues, its eyes glowing, super creepy. Stephen flees into the largest and nicest public museum bathroom I've ever seen. Stephen, I could say us. Why is it sinks on both sides? This time? You need Where's to give the control. actual you toilet. Understand what control of what, what you're talking about. I think there's another that side. About to break through the door. I love how for all of this, we stay in one take, transitioning through whip pants, but staying in Steven's point of view. At first, the Mark reflection turns to face him while all the other infinite Steven reflections match Steven's movement. But after Steven turns to look at the door and then back to Mark, now only the Mark reflection is there in the mirror. So there may be other infinite identities in this mind, but Mark has the full attention right now. And then the music cuts out as he says, Look, you're not gonna die. Let me save us. And so Stephen finally looks directly at Mark into his eyes, and the transformation begins. Though notice, while the sure was hot. envelop our Mark slash Stephen, in the mirror reflections on the side, nothing is happening. Again, from the standpoint of objective reality, it's hard to really know how much of this is truly real. Flickering on the bathroom walls are glowing hieroglyphics, and then we cut to outside the bathroom, initially hearing the scuffle, but then Sink crashes against the wall, and the Jackal tries to flee, but Moon Knight drags him back in. That nigga it was trying to run, sinks, bro. Giving us another mirrored surface to reflect this character in from his below. Shit. He turns to us, glowing white eyes from behind the mummy wrappings and a hood with the crescent moon sigil and a beaked tip of that hood, evoking the skull of Khonshu. Suspended in his chest, in those mummy wrappings, is his crescent moon weapon. Our final image of the episode leaves us with Moon Knight's eyes, glowing white like the yeah, moon. The color ended. white is important to Moon Knight. Described amazingly in Charlie Houston's 2006 comics, I don't wear white to hide myself. I wear it so they'll see me coming, so they'll know who it is. Because when they see white, it doesn't matter how good a target I am. Their hands shake so bad. <laughs> what the hands. fuck type I of demon? Bro, this thing is a whole demon, bro. What the, the fuck? And He's actually on time. <laughs> He's being afraid. He's black force energy, glowing, dog. <laughs> What the hell? Again, check out our awesome Moon Knight merch over at New York. Nigga said, I want them to see me coming, bro. That nigga's crazy, bro. From the first episode, episode steven and mark are definitely two completely different personalities uh i ain't know that about moon knight i mean we haven't even seen or like heard him talk as moon knight yet but i ain't know that that was the reason why he wore white a bright ass white uh suit because he wants the enemy to know it's him wants them to know that he's about to fuck they shit up basically but 
Yeah, from the moment the episode started, and then it showed the part where the dude was putting on the sandals with the glass. Uh, that was um, very confusing. I was like, what the fuck is going on? Glad he explained that. I will say, I am still a little bit confused on where he woke up. Uh, I forget what he said, where exactly he woke up when he jumped out the, stu- the two-story building and then landed in the grass. There was that. The... <laughs> I'm glad that they are choosing to do it that way in terms of like what every time that he transformed or like gave control over to Mark, it just was like a blink. It was like a second and then it just went right back to Steven instead of having him change and then show the fight scene. I feel like it would have, um, I don't know, I guess like thrown off the suspense of seeing or waiting to see what's about to happen. But uh, that scene when he finally did regain consciousness and then he was covered in blood, that was easily the most brutal shit I've seen. That was the most brutal shit I've seen in Marvel. That nigga had, like his whole fist was just dripping blood. I was like, God damn, bro. They ain't playing, bro. They are not playing with this character. Um, I don't know if they was running low on time or something (laughs) or if that is just really how they wanted to do it. Where he first transformed into Moon Knight and then it just showed the Jackal getting like, well, like he said, it was a noise at first. I was literally thinking in my head as it was going on. I was like, something tells me he's whip, whooping that nigga's ass. Like, I don't know why, but I feel like it's like no competition. But and then the, the Jackal flies out the room trying to crawl away. And then he just drags it back in. I was like, oh, yeah, he's on time. He's definitely, he's something else. And then he pulled it back in and just started pinging him. Um, so I don't know if later in the show they're going to introduce, like, bigger versions of the Jackal or stronger versions. So that, like, or multiple at once. Um, something to like actually give Moon Knight a challenge when he's fighting. But I was really hoping to see a little bit more, but then the episode just ended as soon as he walked towards the screen. I was like, damn, man. And I don't even know how often we get episodes. I don't know if it's every a new one every day or just one a week. I don't know how they do it, but I'll be waiting. I will be waiting for that second episode. So, uh, yeah, y'all let me know what y'all thought of episode one. Um, If you enjoyed my reaction, feel free to hit the like button, subscribe and share. And I will see you all in the next one.